Hey everyone, so we just got out of the NVIDIA event for the 2070, 2080, and 2080 Ti launch, which includes official specifications and pricing from NVIDIA. NVIDIA could have handled the event a lot better overall, as we'll talk about momentarily, but for now we do have the core specifications that we can go through and some release dates and prices. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA CLC280 liquid cooler. People ask me how I keep cool during the summer with all this hair. Well, I've tried a lot of different products, and few do exactly what I need. Many of them cause tangles or worse. EVGA CLC280 helps keep my core temperatures low during hot benchmarking sessions. The CLC280 is price competitive and focuses on performance for value, offering a 280 liquid cooler at an affordable price. Get yours at the link in the description below. Hair mounting kit sold separately. The RTX 2070, 80, and 2080 Ti were all officially announced today. The announcement could have been a lot better. There were many things that were uh, really not the best with the way NVIDIA handled this event, but perhaps that will be discussed in a different video. Just to clarify something here on the pricing, so there's two sets of pricing that NVIDIA released. There's one on their website, which is for $600, $800, and $1,200. And then there's one that was released at the event for $500, $700, and $1,000. And that one had a different slide. And we think it either coincides with the reference pricing versus FE pricing. So there might be two disparate SKUs or it could just be a miscommunication. We're really not sure at this time. Other than that, though, we do have some pricing from Gigabyte, which seems to coincide more closely with the higher prices. So a Gigabyte range is 790 to 830 for the 2080 and 1170 to a bit more than that for the 2080 Ti. So we have some partner card prices already. It'll be linked in the article in the description below if you want more. And September 20th for the availability of the 2080, 2080 Ti and the 2080 with a 2070 TBD. No release date on that just yet. The cooler is the most interesting next thing other than hard specs. And that's because it looks like NVIDIA is going for a dual axial cooler, much like most of their partners do or have done in the past. In the renders, if they're representative of the real product, they have 13 blades across two fans and they are positioned over the VRM and over the GPU core, as you would expect. So this is particularly interesting because moving to a dual axial cooler is going to be more similar to what the partners do, especially for the two fan cards, which means that I don't know, we could see some of the partners getting pushed either out of the market or towards three fan coolers. And that's probably why a lot of the leaked coolers you saw were three fan, because NVIDIA is doing this. So very interesting, very interesting and curious implications for the partners where, I'll be honest, I'm a bit concerned that there might be some uh, NVIDIA kind of pushing the, the partners around or out of the market at some of the price points where they've existed in the past. But it all depends on how good that dual axial cooler is that NVIDIA made. The leaked PCB shots looked like 70 amp power stages. If that's accurate for the 2080 Ti, then that's a pretty damn good VRM too. What we uh, also know is that the specs for the cards remain largely the same as what we saw leading up to launch. So just to go over each card individually, we have the 2070 up first. This one has 2304 CUDA cores. CUDA cores are just FPUs. So uh, an FPU is not really a true core and SM is closer to that. They can't do a lot of things that cores can do. Uh, they can compute, but they can't fetch and put stuff into registers from registers. Can't really work with the cache quite the same way as a core can. So you get the idea. But regardless, 2304 FPUs on the 2070. It's got a 1710 megahertz boost clock. And this is for the Founders Edition. I need to note that too. So there are two specs for the NVIDIA cards today. There's the Founders Edition and the reference spec. And the reference, I believe, is what the partners will be starting from. The Founders is a bit higher. So it's kind of going back to the confusion that NVIDIA created in Austin in 2016 when we had to make a special video clarifying what the heck Founders Edition means. Because at the time, it actually wasn't special. All it meant was reference, except renamed. But now, it looks like it is going to be a bit special in that it's got a bit of a higher clock than the reference spec. So FE might actually go towards what people mistakenly thought it was in 2016. That's kind of what it looks like right now. Base clock 1410 for both reference and FE, 14 gigabits per second memory speed, eight gigabytes of GDDR6 256-bit memory interface for the 2070, 448 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, and then all of the other stuff is as you would expect. Uh, also, these cards have NVLink support, which is pretty interesting too. So we'll talk about that more perhaps in a secondary video, but uh, 
SLI as we know it is going away and NVLink is what's going to be replacing it. For the next card, let's talk about the 2080. We'll just go in order here. 2080, 2944 FPUs, or CUDA cores as they call it, 1800 megahertz boost clock, 1515 base, and the reference non-FE version is 1710 for the boost clock. That's the only difference. The memory configuration is 8 gigabytes of GDDR6. They've got 14 gigabytes per second memory speed, 256-bit memory interface width, and 448 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. And then the 2080 Ti, 4352 FPUs for that one, pretty big. And 1635 boost clock or 1545 for the reference spec as opposed to the FE spec, 1350 for the base clock. Same memory except 11 gigabytes, 352 bit bus, so 1616 gigabytes per second. And that leads us back to a few other notes from the presentation or things that we kind of thought and put together while we were watching it. First one, NVLink for SLI, $80 for the bridge if you want it. And NVIDIA, frankly, hasn't done a great job of convincing us that we need SLI or that it's worth buying, but we'll see if that changes. NVLink's quite a bit different. It's possible that S SLI could now come back into play with NVLink if the developers support it. That's the big question. But either way, it's a difference and it's interesting. The cooler we kind of talked about, a little unsure of how that's going to affect partners and partner relations, but uh, NVIDIA is in a dominant position in the market, and they don't really need to worry that much about much of anything. The next part, in the presentation, routinely, Jensen Huan stated that the it would take 10 1080 Ti's to keep up with one Tensor Core. One note on this, that does not mean that one GPU from a 1080 Ti class card, one 1080 Ti, uh, is going to be that different, a 10x change versus one tensor core. That's not what that means. So when they're talking about tensor core speeds and being 10 times the speed of a 1080 Ti, what is really being discussed is the deep learning capabilities, machine learning, AI processing. These things are a bit different than what we deal with in graphics. So one 1080 Ti does not equal one tenth of a Turing GPU or even a tensor core is what they're really saying. Uh, in fact, what is happening is that one tensor core can do 10 times the work of a 1080 Ti in specific applications like deep learning and machine learning. So that I just thought was important to note because probably a lot of people uh, might not catch that part. Image processing is a big one, by the way, like if you're processing billions of images or something like that. Next one. So uh, there was a lot of time spent talking about shadows, shadow occlusion, ray tracing, recaps of the event from March, all the same information. Uh, Turing's been in development for 10 years, according to the CEO on stage, and it's the second largest ever made behind the V100 for the Quadro class high-end cards that were revealed previously. The SM is brand new. It can do independent FP and integer operations to split color and address processing. How that affects gaming or if it affects gaming, uh, TBD. The next thing of note here, so another item in the presentation, 2x speed of a 1080 Ti, but only with 4K DLSS mode enabled. So one of the slides they showed said 2x speed of a 1080 Ti. That may well certainly be true and probably is, but the specific instance that was true was with 4K resolution with a new special mode enabled. And this is similar to what we saw with the 1080 Ti where, yeah, in 4K it was pretty substantially advantaged over the 1080. Uh, so not saying that it's misleading, it's, it really wasn't. They had it on the screen, it was pretty obvious. But I did want to make sure that everyone in the audience caught what was on the screen, which is that the 2X speed is under specific circumstances. Next one, the phone number that was on the screen that was part of the joke uh, was RTX 2080, so that name was revealed pretty early on. The DGX4 Voltas, so DGX had four Voltas on it, processing that Star Wars image that was shown a long time ago, half a year ago, and the frame time for that was 55 milliseconds. One Touring card was 45 milliseconds. They wanted to point that out. Pa Pascal was 308 and had an 8x claims difference by NVIDIA. And uh, also a Touring frame assembly. So if we talk about the pipeline for Turing frames with tracing one of these like Star Wars type images, it's ray trace, integer 32 shading, FP32 shading, and DNN processing. It is semi-asynchronous. So FP32 shading happens during the entire frame. We have a, a block diagram of it. And ray tracing and integer 32 happen simultaneously with FP32. This is important. As we saw with the Titan V, asynchronous compute is taking a big step forward for NVIDIA in this generation. So we talked about it then. We confirmed it with NVIDIA at the time. Asynchronous compute is, 
if you're kind of looking past all the ray tracing stuff and at just the hard performance numbers, async compute is going to be where it's at uh, for this card or this generation, assuming it's integrated properly with Vulkan or whatever the case may be. DNN generates pixels that haven't been finished yet. This is kind of interesting. So new information with AI will be generated by the card so that it can finish frames faster and leave some pixels unfinished and then fill them in synthetically. Uh, also, there's a new weighted number of Terra RTX Ops, they're calling it, which is a weighting for FP32 and teraflops per gig array. So they went with Terra RTX Ops. And one note was they said 78 Terra RTX Ops for the 2080, I would assume, TI, or basically touring card, uh, versus 12 Terra RTX Ops, it's a mouthful, for Titan X. Did not specify which Titan X, there are three or four of them, so I uh, could have used that clarification there. And I think that pretty much covers it. So big things here to talk about. Partner impact. How does a dual fan axial card impact what the partners make this generation? I think we're gonna see a lot of three fan cards as a result, and probably, depending on the price floor for them, it's going to be harder to compete with Nvidia at the absolute low end. Another potential point of impact, Pascal and AMD, neither of which have the capabilities for processing things like ray tracing that the touring cards do. So as ray tracing becomes an actual thing in real time, if it does in this generation, uh, there's a bit of a concern where if you have it enabled, it's probably gonna kill the performance on both Pascal and AMD. So it's not just an anti-AMD move, it's anti-everything that's not touring, which is fine, that's progress and that's how technology moves. It's just that, keep in mind, just like with all the other high-end effects with any game that's come out, whether it's an AMD effect or an NVIDIA effect, you'll have to disable it to improve the uh, performance on older generation cards. Not that new, but something worth noting. Ray tracing is the next kind of skeptical point where this requires developer integration. RTX is an NVIDIA thing. It's an SDK that will allow developers to more or less plug and play real-time ray tracing. But even still, even with it being pre-programmed, it takes a while for developers to make that commitment. Games take years to develop, and they probably haven't had access to the SDK for a significant period of time. It's been months, for sure, but not on the scale of years, as far as we're aware. So it could be a while before real-time ray tracing games, other than what was shown on stage, the couple of them there were, really take market share. And that means that the ray tracing stuff might not be super relevant for this generation, or at least this launch, but perhaps the future ones. Next big question, what happens with a 2050 class card? Do the tensor cores on that have enough oomph to really actually do real-time ray tracing in any meaningful way? So lots of stuff to think about with this launch, but that's it for this one. Subscribe for more. We'll definitely have more videos on this as we process the information. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our shirts, mod mats, or other merchandise, and go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.